Carissa Page Boudreaux, a 12-year-old girl from Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, vanished under strange circumstances on the evening of January 27, 2008. She was thought to have fled after a disagreement with her mother, Penny Boudreaux, during a trip to the local store. The investigation took an unexpected turn, and the community was taken aback by what was revealed. So, what caused Carissa's sudden demise? What happened on that fateful day? Friends, hello and welcome back to Real Crime Explained. Today, we'll look at Carissa Page Boudreaux's case. But first, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel by clicking the subscribe button and bell symbol below. Also, remember to like and share. Without further ado, let's get started on this puzzle. Bridgewater is a small coastal village in Nova Scotia, Canada, located on the La Havre River. It is the largest town on the South Shore, with a population of about 8,000 people. While Bridgewater is best recognized as a commercial and industrial center, it also hosts a lot of cultural events. The annual Bridgewater Garden Party, Christmas on La Havre, and the Growing Green Sustainability Festival are among them. A sad incident occurred in the midst of the bustling activity and serene surroundings. A crime that disturbed the tranquility of this tiny village. Carissa Page Boudreaux was born in Yarmouth County, Nova Scotia, Canada on October 4, 1995. Penny and Paul Boudreaux were her parents. Carissa was well known for her friendliness and her constant grin. She found consolation and joy in life's small pleasures. She enjoyed playing Nintendo DS games, swimming, collecting stuffed animals, reading books, and listening to Miley Cyrus and Hilary Duff's music. But Carissa had one dream that burned brightly in her heart. She was adamant about becoming a veterinarian and dedicated her life to caring for and curing the furry and feathered species. Carissa's life took an unexpected turn when the pages of her book turned. Circumstances eventually led to her parents' divorce. Despite this upheaval, Carissa was lucky enough to retain both of her parents' adoration. Carissa found herself temporarily living with her father in Shelburne County for a time. However, by early 2008, she was fully settled in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, with her mother, Penny, in her two-bedroom apartment. Penny had a boyfriend called Vernon McCumber, who shared their apartment at the time. Carissa started sixth grade at Bridgewater Elementary School in her new neighborhood. Carissa and her family appeared to be doing well. However, fate, with its devilish grin, had other intentions. A mother's heart sunk on a freezing January evening, the 27th of January 2008, as she wore the Bridgewater Police Department. Penny was that mother, and she had a troubling revelation to impart. Carissa, her 12-year-old daughter, was missing. It all started earlier that day with a violent confrontation between Penny and Carissa. They found themselves parked outside the Bridgewater Mall at 5.30 p.m. Carissa chose to wait in the car throughout their argument, while Penny walked into the mall's Sobe store to pick up a few items. She returned to the car after about 15 minutes. Carissa, however, was no longer present, much to her dismay. She began scanning the neighborhood right away, expecting to find her daughter nearby. As the minutes went into hours, it became clear that Carissa was nowhere to be found. Penny returned home with a heavy heart and a rising sense of dread, frantically hoping that Carissa would soon resurface. However, as the clock approached 8.30 p.m. and her daughter was still missing, Penny made the tough decision to call the police. Following the disturbing phone conversation, the search for Carissa was launched. Police and family members joined forces to track her down. They undertook extensive searches and even enlisted the assistance of a rescue dog. The night was fraught of anxiety as everyone waited for any leads or information that would lead Carissa home. Bridgewater held its breath, hoping for an answer to the mystery, and a family clung to hope, hoping for Carissa's safe return. However, no search attempts were successful that day, leaving investigators with a depressing revelation. Carissa appeared to have escaped. The fact that Carissa was unprepared for the adverse weather conditions at the time of her abduction concerned the authorities. She was dressed inappropriately for the bitter cold that swept the area, wearing a black sweatshirt, a black vest, and blue jeans. The morning of January 28, 2008 arrived with a rush. Bridgewater police officers understood the gravity of the situation and took swift action.
They contacted other law enforcement agencies, spreading the news far and wide in their unrelenting quest for Carissa. The search for answers quickly became a public spectacle. Investigators meticulously investigated security tapes from establishments around the Bridgewater Mall, which revealed details about Carissa's disappearance. They pieced together Carissa's mother, Penny's, account, establishing that she had definitely been in the Sobies, as she described. A sad reality, however, surfaced. The parking area of the mall had no surveillance cameras. They couldn't tell if Carissa was present or which direction she might have gone if she had left the location without this. The lack of specific proof created a problem, but it only served to fuel the detective's zeal. They stayed steadfast, refusing to give up their quest for Carissa. The dawn of January 29, 2008 marked a watershed moment in the search for Carissa. Penny, Carissa's mother, spoke at a press conference. Her eyes filled with tears and her voice trembled with emotion. She pleaded for her daughter's safe return, encouraging Carissa to call them and let them know she was well. I don't really what to say. Um, I hope she's listening. I don't know if I can do this. It's okay. We all love you. We all love Carissa. We love you. Your grandparents are looking for you. All of us are. I don't know where you are, but just come home or call or something, please. And all your friends are looking for you and we're all worried. We just want you home safe. It's not like we're going to get mad. We just want you home safe. Please. Penny revealed more details concerning Carissa's disappearance during the press conference. She said that she had taken Carissa for a drive in the hopes of having a heart-to-heart -heart chat about some underlying concerns. Penny revealed that Carissa had been dissatisfied with their present living circumstances and had failed to establish friends since moving to Bridgewater. Unfortunately, their talk devolved into a quarrel about seemingly insignificant issues. Carissa's father, Paul, was also there at the news conference, representing the united front of a desperate family. With a sad heart, he joined Penny in pleading with his daughter to return home. Their impassioned appeal struck a profound chord with not only those in the room, but also the larger community. As the sun set on the day of the highly charged press conference, a ray of optimism appeared. A tip had reached the police ears, a piece of information that could lead them closer to Carissa. Though the specifics of the advice were not revealed, their significance was clear. The Lunenburg County Ground Search and Rescue Team sprung into action with a newfound feeling of purpose. Their steps led them to William Hebb Road in Hebbville, guided by the tip. As they scored the area, their eyes examining every inch of it, the night air was thick with expectation. Their attempts had yielded no results four hours later. As the hunt for that day came to an end, a profound sense of disappointment coexisted with their unrelenting determination. Meanwhile, the community was also helping in the search for Carissa. Concerned parents banded together, using social media sites to spread the word about her missing. Their efforts helped to build a network of support, giving people a place to come together and help Carissa's mother, Penny. Donations flooded in, indicating the community's will to assist in any way it could. Missing person posters with Carissa's photos were frequently placed around Bridgewater and beyond. They were a continuous reminder of her absence, encouraging anyone with knowledge to come forward. Two police officers performed an intensive search at numerous areas on January 31, 2008. They scored the La Havre River, the Bridgewater Mall, and the rural regions around the town with a Department of Natural Resources helicopter. Despite their extensive search, no trace of Carissa's disappearance was discovered. The setting was set for another news conference on February 1, 2008. Penny, Carissa's mother, ascended the stage once more, her voice full of sadness and determination. I'm just here to reach out to my daughter, um, Carissa. I just want to tell you that you have lots of people who love you and want you home. Your Aunt April is here, your mom is here, your dad, Shane, Vernon, your Uncle Joey, your Aunt Chrissy, your friend Sarah's worried sick, everybody at school, your grandmothers, everybody. Please just reach out to someone. At least call us and let you know you're okay. We all love you. 
If there's anybody out there that knows, have seen her or anything, please call. The other thing I want to say is I want to thank everyone in the community that's been a support. All the businesses we both work for and the community in general. Um, it's been very comforting. Nothing can be done to make things better, but it's comforting to have support. The main thing is I just want somebody to come forward. If not Chris herself, somebody, let me know. It's hard to not know where your kid is. She begged again, her eyes welling up with tears. Her sentiments echoed the pain of a parent hoping for the safe return of her kid. She described the unbearable agony of not knowing where her daughter was. The cops stood with Penny, firm in their determination to find Carissa. They addressed the public, emphasizing that there has been no proof of Carissa being harmed thus far. The remarks provided a ray of hope in the midst of a sea of uncertainty. The search for Carissa intensified in the days following the press presentation. Divers braved the Lahav River's frigid waters, searching the area behind the Bridgewater Mall and downstream to Shipyard's Landing. Their search was completed by February 6, 2008, and the police declared that they were convinced Carissa was not in the river. On February 7, 2008, the police continued their diligent pursuit of leads. Carissa's possible sightings were reported from all throughout the Maritimes. As the community waited for a breakthrough, each lead was meticulously scrutinized. Despite their best attempts, Carissa remained elusive. On February 9, 2008, a strange turn of events occurred. A motorist traveling through the region made a startling discovery. A deceased body lay partially covered in snow on the bank of the Lahav River, just outside the boundaries of Bridgewater town limits in Conqueror Bank. The hour was around 11.30 a.m., the discovery quickly spread like wildfire, and forensic specialists descended on the spot. Meanwhile, the police called Carissa's family and broke the devastating news that human remains had been discovered. However, they withheld more information from the public, leaving many issues unanswered. The next day, February 10, 2008, authorities confirmed with caution that the retrieved body belonged to a young white female. They did, however, highlight that an identification would not be made until the autopsy was completed. Hundreds of people gathered in the Sobeys parking lot for a prayer vigil dedicated to Carissa in the midst of this emotional roller coaster. They stood there together, unsure if the bones belonged to their beloved Carissa. However, the truth began to emerge in the days that followed. The body discovered by the riverside was definitively identified as Carissa after a study of dental records. On February 13, 2008, an autopsy found something disturbing. She'd been strangled to death. There was considerable relief when no evidence of abuse was discovered. At the same time, authorities were baffled, especially given the distressing detail that her jeans and panties were pulled down when she was discovered. The police conducted a press conference on February 14, 2008, to reveal to the public that the body belonged to Carissa, turning the missing person case into a homicide investigation. This shocking news rocked the community, as her sad murder was the first in Bridgewater in nearly 20 years. Three Bridgewater citizens were arrested for questioning on the same day, sparking a commotion in the town. Though the authorities did not reveal their identities, they did state that the murder was not random and that Carissa had some link to her assailant. However, the anxiety rose the next day when it was revealed that all three people arrested had been released with no charges made against them. Carissa's body was returned to her father, Paul Boudreaux, by the Nova Scotia Medical Examiner's Office on February 16, 2008. The spot where Carissa was discovered was turned into a poignant memorial in a beautiful gesture of remembrance. Mourners honored the life that was gone by leaving many trinkets, toys, and flowers. On February 19, 2008, hundreds of people gathered in Shelburne County to say their goodbyes to Carissa. Her father and grandparents still lived in this small village. Reverend Perry Ingersoll officiated at the sad funeral service. During the service, a slideshow of Carissa's beautiful moments with her loved ones was shown, and tears ran down the faces of those in attendance. Two of Carissa's aunts stood up and delivered poems to the sorrowful throng, offering peace and words of comfort. Carissa was finally laid to rest in Clark's Harbor Cemetery when all was said and done.
Bridgewater joined together four days later, on February 23, 2008, to mourn Carissa at a touching memorial ceremony organized by nine churches. Bridgewater's daughter, the village had accepted her as one of their own. Penny moved to Halifax, a city roughly 80 kilometers distant from Bridgewater, after her daughter's funeral. She relocated, possibly in search of a new beginning in a different location. Following all of this, detectives dedicated themselves to the tireless pursuit of justice. Weeks flew by as they sifted through every scrap of evidence, relentlessly following up on leads and tips from the community. They worked around the clock, propelled by a common sense of duty, to discover the individual responsible for Carissa's death and bring this awful case to a close. As worried citizens sought answers and solace in shared chats, the neighborhood coffee shops were buzzing with discussion about the crime. As the research progressed, a troubling prospect began to emerge. Investigators began to suspect that Penny, Carissa's mother, was implicated in her daughter's terrible death. Concerns were heightened by allegations from neighbors, who detailed a frightening occurrence that occurred just days after Carissa's body was discovered in Penny's apartment. According to witnesses, Penny and her boyfriend, Vernon, had a violent argument inside the flat. The neighbors could hear their shouts becoming louder and louder, accompanied by the sound of running water. Penny appeared to be in the bathtub as Vernon declared his refusal to assist her with something. Vernon continuously questioned Penny, expressing his disdain and threatening to leave her, and their quarrel resonated through the walls. The actual nature of their communication was unknown, but these occurrences raised severe red flags for the investigators. Because of these troubling developments, the investigators focused their attention on Penny and Vernon. The inquiry into the once tragic case took a disturbing turn as it began to delve into the nuances of family dynamics and the secrets concealed behind closed doors. Undercover spies invaded Vernon's life in a calculated effort, posing as members of a notorious crime syndicate. As they gained his trust, they discussed Carissa's murder. Vernon denied any involvement in the crime, but he told them of his suspicions about Penny's possible role. He stated that he was keeping a tight check on her in order to insulate himself from any possible involvement in the crime. This information complicated the investigation even further. A terrible revelation awaited the detectives when they turned their attention to Penny. Undercover officers, as in Vernon's case, pretended to be members of a crime gang and contacted Penny. They promised her help if she admitted to the unthinkable, the murder of her own daughter and the circumstances surrounding it. Penny, shockingly, fell into their trap in June of 2008. She confessed to a crime that would send shivers down anyone's spine, unaware that concealed cameras were recording every word. Penny recalled the events of that fateful evening in her terrifying revelation. She said that she and Carissa had gone to a nearby grocery shop, where she called Vernon and cooked up a tale about Carissa's abduction. Penny then drove her naive daughter to a remote road and coldly instructed her to step out of the car. Penny's true nature revealed amid the darkness and isolation of the cave. Penny pulled Carissa to the ground, her heart filled with darkness. She got a piece of twine and wrapped it around Carissa's neck securely. She then ruthlessly suffocated her own flesh and blood. Carissa pleaded, Mommy, don't, in a heartbreaking scene. Penny, however, remained oblivious to her desperate plannings. After murdering Carissa, Penny hid her body in the trunk of her car and drove around, pondering her next move. She threw away the twine in a coffee shop before dumping Carissa's body beside the frigid Old Havre River. Penny also took off some of Carissa's clothes to give the impression of maltreatment. She then threw these goods, as well as one of Carissa's sandals, in a rubbish can at a nearby swimming pool. Penny revealed a stunning revelation when questioned about her motivation for killing her own daughter. Vernon, her lover, had given her an ultimatum, forcing her to choose between him and her kid. Penny declared in a strange display of devotion that she would do everything to have Vernon by her side. The prospect of losing him was more agonizing to her than the unthinkable act of murdering her own child. Penny's motivation for the murder was extremely alarming, demonstrating how far she was willing to go for the sake of her romance. Penny was arrested and charged with the first-degree murder of her own daughter on June 14, 2008. The arrest's news spread like wildfire, leaving neighbors astonished and unable to fathom the horrific reality.
Carissa's father, Paul, was among many who were horrified to learn that Penny had known the truth about their daughter's destiny all along. As he struggled to come to terms with the unexplainable actions of the lady he once loved, the weight of betrayal and loss weighed hard on him. Meanwhile, following Penny's arrest, Vernon was questioned by officials. He angrily denied ever issuing an ultimatum to Penny, disputing her claim and defending his innocence. Instead, he explained that he'd voiced concern about Penny and Carissa's constant squabbling, implying that something needed to be done to alleviate the mounting tension. Vernon admitted that he had no idea what dark path Penny would eventually take. Penny appeared in court for the first time on June 16, 2008. She sobbed violently, clutching a tissue in her quivering hands, unable to speak as the murder charge was read out. The gathering was filled with collective grief and disbelief over Carissa's tragic death. A crowd had formed outside the courthouse as Penny was let out, their emotions running high. The air was filled with taunts of child killer and murderer. Penny found herself in the Bridgewater courtroom on December 4, 2008. As she sat rocking back and forth, the room was filled with anxiety. Lawyers conferred about upcoming court hearings, setting dates for future appearances. Finally, the court scheduled her next appearance for January 30, 2009, leaving Penny with a long wait before facing the full force of the judicial system once more. On January 30, 2009, the courtroom was tense as Penny submitted her guilty plea to the lesser charge of second-degree murder. Accepting the plea offer was made in order to avoid a lengthy trial. Penny, dressed in a black t-shirt and trousers, sobbed hysterically throughout the hearing. Carissa's father, Paul, delivered a victim impact statement during the hearings, his comments resonating with tremendous pain. He talked on how a single selfish act had broken his happiness and destroyed his hopes and dreams. You know, for, for a parent to just make that decision, I still can't comprehend it. She had many options. There was many people around her that would have gladly, gladly, you know, had I known this was going to happen, I would never, ever let her go back. But I mean, what parent's going to try to, you know, say, no, you can't go back and see your mother? As the sentence day approached, the presiding judge, Justice Margaret Stewart, cast a glance at Penny and spoke words that pierced through the heaviness of the courtroom. Finally, the statement was read aloud. Penny was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 20 years from the day of her arrest. Penny rose momentarily to face the court as the weight of her sentencing dawned on her, her voice scarcely audible. I'm sorry, she said quietly. As Paul exited the courthouse, his emotions were still raw from the events. He couldn't help but voice his amazement and displeasure. He talked with a mix of rage and despair, accusing Penny of crying only crocodile tears over their daughter's death. Paul couldn't help but wonder about Penny's choices. He was perplexed as to why she hadn't considered allowing their daughter to live with him or another caring family member. Vernon acknowledged his tremendous sorrow about Carissa's loss in an interview following her death. He expressed his love for her and his deep regret for not being able to protect her. Vernon also stated the difficulties he had obtaining work because of his involvement with the case, which led him down a path of drinking. A terrible thing like this happened, you know, it just was hard on me. People thought I'd, I'd done something, or, and I had to live with that, you know. Even with the work, I had to leave Bridgewater and, because people had their opinions about me. And I, I've had it affected me trying to get a job as well, uh, down here. You know, every time I, I applied for a place or something, they they'd always they knew about what went on and they had their own decision about that, right? So I had a hard time getting work as well. Meanwhile, Paul was resolved not to let his daughter's awful death define his life. Due to his nervousness, visiting Bridgewater, where the crime occurred, was initially overwhelming for him. Paul explained, I was so nervous that I couldn't even pull in the exit. However, he was able to overcome his worries and rebuild his life in Shelburne over time. He found love and companionship with a woman named Kim, and the two of them treasured Carissa's memory. Paul made certain that their daughter, Carmi, was aware of her deceased older sister. The murder of Carissa reminds us of the depths of human evil and the intricacies of human connections. It makes us consider the necessity of nurturing and safeguarding the vulnerable, as well as the implications of decisions based on wrong priorities or desperation. One question remains as we conclude this chapter. 
Do you think Penny would have confessed to taking her own daughter's life if the police had not used strategic techniques to unearth the truth? Please share your ideas in the comments section. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Stay safe, and thank you for tuning in.